Hi everybody, we are here at the Northwest Stream Center where we are going to go on a nature walk created by the Adopt-A-Stream Foundation. It's an elevated boardwalk through a marshy wetlands um, crossing streams and creeks where fish, salmon and trout come up to spawn. Um, there are a lot of great uh, guided um, signs and places to stop and rest and even though we are here in a chilly November day um, it's still a great time to come and see this really beautiful um, place. Uh, we are in Everett, Washington and uh, so let's go take a walk. So here we are at North Creek you can see the, the creek running there in the background. And here's a sign saying, What Fish Call North Creek Home? And this gives you an example of the types of fish that are living here. Silver salmon, cutthroat trout, king salmon, sculpin, western brook lamprey, steelhead and sockeye salmon. All these fish come up to this creek to spawn. And so here is the pathway. Again, here's another window showing you above the stream. Let's see if I can get a closer look. It's a little bit foggy. And here's below the water. Again, it's kind of murky, hard to see anything. But it says that it all starts with insects. The ability of a stream to support the life depends on them. And these are a variety of insects that live in the streams. Mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. And fish feed on these. And then, going up the chain, the food chain, birds feed on the fish. And raccoons feed on the fish and even coyote. And it all starts with the insects. And now we are above the water stream. it flows along. Eventually, it goes out to Lake Washington. Let's see where the path leads us here. So here the walkway becomes gravel. But it's nice and compact, so easy to walk on. See some nice mossy rocks here. And some more signs. This one says, welcome to nature's refrigerator. Areas next to streams, lakes, and wetlands where moisture-loving plants thrive are called the riparian zones. And during warm, sunny days, the riparian vegetation acts like nature's refrigerator. 
The trees and shrubs provide shade that cools the air and the temperature. Temperature of the water flowing through North Creek. Salmon and trout in the stream need cool water to survive. And during rainy periods, vegetation near the creek helps to maintain good water quality by absorbing pollution, washing off land from the surrounding watershed. And it says that the riparian zone also provides a wide variety of wildlife with food from berries, roots, and leaves. Leaves that fall into the creek become food for underwater insects that in turn become food for fish. And follow the pathway here. Looks like we're coming to a bridge. It says, trout stream crossing. Maybe we'll see some trout. Here you can hear the water as it comes down the creek. Streams and rivers always flowing, never stopping. Let's look on the other side of the bridge, see if we can see trout. It's like a pond out there. Don't see many trout down there. There's the bridge we just came over. You can hear the rushing of water behind it. I just wanted to show how beautiful this paving is and how they've put moss and rocks in between the stones. And then we have a little sign here about this marsh that you can sort of see in the background here. And I'll tell you about it. It's called the Rebirth of a Marsh. This wetland was once home to cars and trucks in the early 1970s. It was filled in with dirt and rock and turned into a parking lot. In 1993, it was restored to a watery home for frogs, herons, salamanders, muskrats, and many other birds and wetland creatures. As you can see, habitat loss does not have to be forever. People can bring damaged habitat back to life. And that's what they are doing here. Let's go check out the marsh. Look at this beautiful red twig dogwood. Becoming brightly red for the winter months. And there you can see in the background is the marsh. Some reflection of the sky in the water. This boardwalk is a lovely elevated nature trail and it was constructed with 100% recycled plastic lumber. It says it represents approximately 1.95 million reused one gallon plastic milk jugs. What a great way to reuse plastic milk jugs, huh? You can see a lot of algae on the water there in the marsh. and vegetation. 
Here we come to another part of the marsh, which they call the Waterfowl Overlook. And here are some of the birds that you might see. All kinds of ducks. And this is one of my favorite, the wood duck. spot any it's kind of a chilly overcast day today can you hear the birds in the forest continue on our way. You can see there's water on both sides. It's a beautiful walkway and very even and smooth so I think Walkers and even wheelchairs could manage this. Here we have some big logs in the marsh. And there's the, the root of that tree. And it eventually crosses the entire little marsh here. Stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is actually one of my favorite plants to make a tea from. It doesn't sting once it's cooked and it's actually really nutritious for you. Wow, look at the beautiful red berries on this cranberry bush maybe? Birds must love these, huh? You can hear all kinds of wildlife and see all kinds of wildlife from the water to the bushes, to the tops of the trees into the sky. There are some nice mucky, marshy areas. It says here that this is a beaver channel. The channel that is flowing toward us is approximately three feet deep. The beavers that wanted to ensure that they had a place to escape from predators carefully excavated this channel. Very clever, those beavers. You can see it goes right under the bridge here, out the other side. Here you can see the water rippling through the leaves. Can you hear it? Water always moving, always flowing. I think that this large plant down here, with its leaves now laying splayed out, is skunk cabbage. Yeah, you can see it on both sides.
Look at the beautiful colors of these ferns as they start to die back for winter. It's a really gorgeous, rusty color. And then you have the variation of colors on the trees behind it. And this lichen. Winter colors. Here's an old stump that has become a nurse log. They call it a nurse log because it has given life to offspring. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a shrub here that has grown out the side of this old stump. And you can see some of the younger ones growing out of the middle of it. And then look at the moss hanging from this branch. It looks like fur. And it almost looks like a creature, doesn't it? Here the pathway gets a little bit darker because we are entering into a cedar grove. See all these cedars and the gorgeous color of the cedar bark. These tall giants of the forest. There's a sign up ahead, which will read. Sounds like this is a favorite place of the birds. And see the way the path zigzags through here. Cedar Cathedral. This is a western red cedar grove, also called Pacific red cedar, western arborvitae, giant cedar, or shinglewood. And it says, can you visualize the ancient forests? The cedar trees were huge and abundant, coming down to the water's edge. Old growth cedars averaged about 230 feet tall and about 65 feet in circumference. The Coast Salish people who lived around here respected the giant cedars that reached to the sky. Cedar Cathedral. So if you come here, this would be a lovely place to stop and sit and ponder these ancient and magnificent trees. Salmon in the forests says that salmon, let me try to hold this up so you can see the stream in the background. 
salmon are ecosystem engineers. They make the amazing forests of the Pacific Northwest what they are. Salmon transport marine sulfur, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in their bodies from the sea to their homes in fresh water streams where they return to spawn. So right through here, through the trees, you can see a couple of stumps. This one is a Douglas fir stump, and they think that it was cut down in the late 1800s or early 1900s. That one was 32 feet in circumference. And this stump over here, which is a Western red cedar, um, was 25 feet in circumference. And they say that the lifespan of these trees can be between 750 to 1,000 years old. Isn't that amazing? Uh -huh. and here we are entering a different sort of grove um, which is dominated by western hemlock. And there's a sign here that talks about the western hemlock. But you can see how delicate it is. Much smaller needles. Very soft to the touch. You can almost smell it, can't you? hear a crow in the distance. I see that we are approaching another stump with some mushrooms growing out of it. That was pretty. Just about anywhere you go in the forest of the Pacific Northwest, you will come across mushrooms. Looks like there's a couple varieties here. This is maybe one variety and perhaps this is another. Or maybe it's just the way they open as they age. I don't know. This is an interesting plant. As you can see, it's got some sharp thorns on it, and this is called Devil's Club. It's an erect shrub, gets up to about 10 feet tall, with thick, unbranched stems and large maple-like leaves. And the leaves are, are dead now. Um, it has white flowers and clusters of sh shiny flat red berries that are eaten by bears, but they are not edible to humans. I don't think I'd want to go very close to this. You can see it's, it's very sharp. For those of you who have lived in the Pacific Northwest for a while, you'll all recognize this. Salal, or Galtheria shalon. It is a creeping evergreen shrub with leathery green leaves and white urn-shaped flowers with edible purple berries, or blue. Wildlife eat the berries while shrubs provide nesting sites. And Native Americans ate the berries fresh or dried into cakes with seal oil. The leaves were chewed as an appetite suppressant and used to flavor fish soup. It's a beautiful evergreen plant and people even use it in their landscapes to just as a beautifier an aesthetic use for it.
And this is a beautiful grove of Salal. So we had a windstorm just a few days ago and it looks like the wind might have blown a tree down. You can see the remains of it here. You can see the rings of the tree. We are crossing a pretty wet area here. And in this water is something called Pacific water parsley. It says it's a perennial that looks like um, parsley, but it also resembles poisonous water hemlock and contains toxins related to it. So it says some Northwest tribes used it medicinally for stomach disorders and headaches, but since it contains toxins, they say the plants should not be eaten. of it. You can hear a trickle of water there. And here's another plant familiar to those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon grape. It's um, yellow flowers that are in clusters, and then they're followed by tart blue berries, which can be used to make jelly. The berries were eaten by Northwest tribes mixed with sweeter fruit. They used shredded bark to make bright yellow dye for baskets and wool. And the bark and the berries were also used medicinally. See if I can get a better close-up here of it. It looks a little bit like holly. It's Oregon grape. I've come across a treasure here. Look at this stump and all of the variety of mushrooms growing on it. Starting from some at the very top. down the side of it. There's some underneath the leaf. All the way to the bottom of it. That's a lot of mushrooms. Here's an area just off of the boardwalk that's full of horsetail. A lot of it is dying back, laying down, getting ready to decompose above the ground for winter. And next spring, it'll pop up fresh and new again. It's an interesting plant. It feels kind of wiry. And I think that people used to use this as scrub brushes, because it is wiry.
and has a lot of silica in it. It's it kind of abrasive. This is a black cottonwood. And there's a sign here describing it. I'll read it. It's a deciduous tree that gets to be about 160 feet tall with sticky fragrant buds and heart-shaped leaves. Catkins followed by fluffy white hairy seeds and they fill the air with cotton in the springtime. Northwest tribes used gum from the spring buds to, to waterproof baskets and soap was made from tree ashes and buckets from young bark and ropes from roots. Leaves and gum were used to treat wounds. Lots of things to do with cottonwood. This stump almost looks like a work of art, like a sculpture, doesn't it? I think it's the root of an old tree. walking through a living museum. Another little piece of nature's art. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It looks as though a twig formed a little bundle of soil and other plants started growing inside of it. And here we have a lovely display of lichen and mosses. It almost looks like it's all decorated for the holidays. Here we are approaching what they called Wild Bird Alley. You can see pileated woodpeckers, barred owls, and many other Northwest birds. And they love it here because of all these, what you call snags. They are dead trees that make beautiful and perfect habitat for wild birds. They will uh, make nesting sites in the old wood. They'll drill holes in the dead wood so that bugs can get in them. And then the birds come back and uh, eat the insects that have gone into those holes that they drilled earlier. Good place to come and sit and watch the birds. I don't see any today. Here's a lovely stand of some more cattail. Again, this plant was used by native people for all kinds of uses, including basket making, and you can eat the roots, and you can do something with the fluffy uh, flowers there. Here is some of the fluff from those cattails. I think I read somewhere that they would use it for um, stuffing, for pillows. It's pretty soft, doesn't it? Another nurse log with a little tree growing out of it. And there you can see that huge leaf from the skunk cabbage. And here you can see the workings of a beaver. You can see how they've been working away at chewing at this tree so that eventually 
gonna fall down. Here are some nice northwest winter plants. It will be looking beautiful throughout the winter. So this is Kanikanik, with the red berries, native to the Pacific Northwest. And then up above here you have some snowberry, also native and loved by the birds.